Hello and welcome to EWTM Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues, all from a Catholic perspective. I'm Catherine Hadro in our Washington, D.C. studio. Thanks for joining us. In this week's show, abortion is the number one killer of black lives in the U.S. The head of the U.S. Bishop Subcommittee on African American Affairs reacts during this Black History Month. A pope who spoke out against the dangers of artificial contraception will be canonized a saint. And this in this fight there are so many things clamoring for people's attention and you just have that brief moment hear how one foundation uses creative means to break through with pro-life messaging but first our top story a court filing reveals an immigrant teenager was forced to accept pro-abortion representation but does not want an abortion an immigrant teen in federal custody known as Jane Doe says she was coerced to request representation by Rochelle Garza and Miles Garza, who have represented other immigrant teens in recent abortion cases. The brief also states Doe does not want an abortion. For analysis on this story, we are joined now by our trusted pro-life expert. Marjorie Dannenfelser is president of the Susan B. Anthony List, Marjorie. Good to have you here to delve into this story. Yes. What is going on with the abortion industry and these immigrant teenagers? It is a truly dramatic moment that everybody needs to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. These young, um, undocumented minors in a desperate situation without their parents are being manipulated into situations that they can't handle. They're being offered abortions before they even want. Mm -hmm. Of course, now we're seeing one um, that did not want an abortion. She was manip manipulated into signing papers, and she had the guts to say, no, I don't want one. Look at her. She's in this negative, horrible environment. She speaks up for her child. It's certainly an example to all of us, but it is definitely a, a sign that we need to do something about this, and the court soon will, will decide this. We'll be following that. You're drawing parallels to Norma McCorvey, who is a plaintiff in Roe v. Wade. Can you it explain is, that? It is really kind of amazing, um, Catherine. Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton were the companion cases mm -hmm. that uh, established the abortion on demand regime. Right. So Sandra Kano and Norma McCorvey were the women behind both of those. Right. Neither, both of them were manipulated into signing papers, didn't quite understand what was happening. Um, neither of them had an abortion. They both turned pro-life and they spent the rest of their lives trying to undo the court decisions that bore their name. So this young woman is in that beautiful tradition. Uh, but one thing is certainly in common is that as soon as the abortion manipulators uh, are done, they leave the young girls um, aside and they're done with them. The pro-life movement sticks with them for life. Um, and that's the beautiful thing about the movement versus the pro-abortion movement. We'll really share their stories Amen. and what's going on there. HHS is an important department when it comes to pro-life policy and we have another new story from the department of HHS. HHS proposed a new rule last month clarifying and implementing a host of existing conscience laws including non-discrimination ones. Among other requirements, the regulation orders health care providers to post notices of conscience protections and outline its enforcement. Marjorie, is this new HHS rule really necessary in your opinion? Yes, it is not just because of the uh, need to have it in regulations in addition to having it in the law because without a regulation we have not had any enforcement of this law for a very long time but also because of the reality of what's happening. Hmm. We know it's not being enforced because nurses like Kathy DiCarlo um, was forced to reassemble the body parts of a 22 week old aborted child um, against obviously her conscience. She came and lobbied on Capitol Hill um, just very recently. There's no question that it's needed from a human and a legal perspective. When speaking about this issue, many people are shocked to hear yeah. that people could be forced against their conscience to perform an abortion. Can you provide some clarity on that? Isn't this illegal? Well, it should be, and and it is, in fact. It's, hmm. it's illegal for um, for any hospital or um, uh, to be forced or individual to be forced to provide abortions or be engaged in them in any way right. against their conscience. But the reason that it goes on is that there have been no rule to back that up. The right. law speaks, but the follow through, the executive action has not. So can these uh, violations of conscience continue. California was in direct violation of this. Their law in California is in direct violation of it, requiring involvement in abortions. So it, it, it screams for clarity. Mm -hmm. And that is why we're insisting that this happen. This is a great 
great start. This rule is a great start. We really also think that there needs to be a private right of action put into the law so that um, so that there is a way for a woman or a man to sue mm -hmm. when they've been forced against their conscience to do such a thing. And is that the further action you'd like to see from the federal government? Yeah, I think that is the next step. This first step is good. This rule must be passed. They have to hear from us mm -hmm. because they're hearing from the other side without question. This is the great first step. Second step is to have that private right of action written into the law. Marjorie Dannenfelser of the Susan B. Anthony List, thank you again for your clarity on these issues. Thank you. The Department of Health and Human Services has taken recent action to enforce abortion conscience laws. So no American is forced to participate in an abortion or is discriminated against for holding pro-life beliefs. This is incredibly important for our freedom. And this week, we are calling on pro-lifers to support this new proposed rule that protects our conscience. Here is this week's call to action. Go to your computer, open up your internet browser, and type in prolifeweekly.com. Once again, that website is prolifeweekly.com. Here, you can send the Trump administration a letter of support for taking action that protects our conscience. Let's be clear, abortion is a brutal procedure. It often involves dismembering unborn children limb by limb. We have tragically seen cases in the United States involving healthcare workers forced to perform abortions against their conscience. But enough is enough. No one should be discriminated against for refusing to provide, pay for, or refer an abortion. This is key for our freedom and for non-discrimination. You don't have to have a religious or conscientious point of view to be disgusted by abortion and to not want to be a part of it. Show your support for this new HHS rule that helps to protect our conscience and protect us pro-lifers from non-discrimination. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com. Once again, that is ProLifeWeekly.com. We turn now to pro-life headlines from around the globe. Pope Francis confirms blessed Pope Paul VI will be canonized a saint sometime this year. The miracle attributed to Paul VI's cause is the healing of an unborn child in the fifth month of pregnancy. Blessed Pope Paul VI is the pontiff behind the 1968 encyclical Humanae Vitae, which strongly condemns artificial contraception. Also in Italy, a court in Milan asks the nation's constitutional court to rule in an assisted suicide advocate's case. Last year, lawmaker Marco Capaldo took a well-known disc jockey, DJ Fabo, to Switzerland to end his life after a car accident left the DJ paralyzed. If the court takes up Capaldo's case, it may tragically lead to the legalization of assisted suicide. And a UK bishop tells the government not to muzzle pro-life outreach as it considers abortion clinic buffer zones. Bishop John Sherrington of the Westminster Archdiocese runs the Day for Life when the local church raises awareness about the value of life. In remarks submitted to the British government, Bishop Sherrington says buffer zones carry a danger of both denying freedom of expression and fostering intolerance. Back here in the United States, we celebrate Black History Month every February, a chance to recognize the central role African Americans have played in U.S. history. Throughout this month, we've seen Planned Parenthood and other abortion advocates push out social media posts and articles claiming to celebrate Black history. We found this odd and dishonest, considering abortion disproportionately kills Black babies in America. And Planned Parenthood's founder is a known racist eugenicist. To dive into this topic, we are joined by our next guest. Bishop Shelton Fobb of the Diocese of Homa Thibodeau is chairman of the U.S. Bishop Subcommittee on African American Affairs. He joins us from Homa, Louisiana. Your Excellency, thank you for your time. Thank you, Catherine. It's a great opportunity and an honor and a privilege to be with you. Thank you, it's our honor. Abortion, Your Excellency, is the number one killer of black lives in the United States. According to numbers from the Centers for Disease Control, more than diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and in New York City, there are more black babies aborted than born. What is your reaction when you hear of these statistics? My reaction is, is heartbreaking, you know, knowing of the many, many 
gifts that the uh, black community brings, uh, being one of the African American bishops, it, it's heartbreaking to know that uh, that that is a challenge that, that our community faces and to know that that many of our children are, are lost to abortion, mm -hmm. uh, the tragedy and, and the evil and the horror of abortion. That's uh, you know, sobering and, and heartbreaking and tragic enough, but you know, equally important is the effect on the women. And as you know, Catherine, more and more we're learning that abortion also mm -hmm. affects the men who father these mm -hmm. children as well. So it's kind of on, on both sides, the loss of all of those precious lives, the children, but then the ramifications of, of abortion in the black community. So it's, it's very sobering, it's, it's very heartbreaking, it's very tragic. There is so much pain involved, and as chair of the U.S. Bishops Subcommittee on African American Affairs, Your Excellency, what will our bishops do to address this tragedy? Yeah, I think the bishops will, will continue to do what, what we have been doing. Of course, the bishops uh, seek to raise our voices and to engage in le legislation that will end or at least curtail abortions in our country. As we know, abortions affect every ethnic community and the bishops are tirelessly mm -hmm. uh, addressing that through legislation and, and advocacy. The other side of it as well is seeking to, to help the women and men uh, post-abortion through, through Project Rachel, uh, seeing that they receive the care that they need for the after effects of abortion, and then just trying to continue to lift up, you know, in a culture of death, mm -hmm. our call that we respect the sanctity and the dignity of all human life in, in all ethnic communities. For our viewers at home, what do you think we as members of the church should be doing? I think they should be doing the same uh, as the bishops, you know, uh, advocating legislation, writing legislators, writing those who, who uh, write our laws, our congressmen, our congresswomen, those uh, who are able to change the laws, to join the bishops in that effort, and then as well kind of to, to bring as much comfort and healing as we can to those who, who have had abortions. You know, I think our efforts need to, need to be joining one another. I do think one other thing that, that the viewers can do though, you know, Catherine, as you're probably aware, the young people today are more and more pro-life. And mm -hmm. I've seen that uh, at the March for Life in Washington. Mm -hmm. I, I have seen that here in the Diocese of Homa Thibodeau in the state of Louisiana. And so I think one of the things the viewers can do and that we as bishops can do and continue to do is to continue to form our young people as pro-life advocates. And that's one area uh, where I see great, great hope in the March for Life and in the pro-life stance of many of our young people today. So I think that's one thing that the viewers can also uh, support our efforts with regard to, and that's talking to our young people mm -hmm. and conveying to them why abortion is so wrong and so evil. Absolutely. Your Excellency, I want to get your take on uh, this next article. Planned Parenthood released an article by a staff member this month called, I'm pro-choice because I'm pro-black. The writer argues an essential part of achieving liberation is to, quote, claim agency over our own bodies. How would you respond to that argument? Well, I, I, I read the whole article, and as, as I understand what, uh, what she is putting forth, she is saying, in essence, she doesn't want uh, someone else making decisions for her. She wants her her human mm -hmm. dignity and all that it means to be human, to be respected. And I find that uh, somewhat inconsistent because what, what the author is saying, she does not want others to deny to her, she's denying to the child in the womb. So I, I see a great inconsistency there. You know, the, the highest value must be life. Mm -hmm. And we must stand up for human dignity, not only the human dignity of, of women, but also the human dignity of the children that they carry uh, in their womb. So I found that article a little bit inconsistent and she never ever mentioned the child in the mm -hmm. womb. So that would be my response to that. I see an inconsistency there because what she is mm -hmm. saying, people are, are denying her and that's why she uh, claims to, make, to take the stand that she does. She's turning around and denying those very same things right. to the child in the womb. And the unborn in their 
choice for their life. Finally. Exactly. Right. Exactly. I mean. Yeah. And finally, what do you make of Planned Parenthood using Black History Month to promote abortions in the African-American community? <laughs> you know, Catherine, uh, if you look at uh, black history, particularly black history here in the United States, at the very heart of uh, black history and, and, and the civil rights movement and everything was a call for respect for the human dignity and the human life of each and every person, mm. a call for, for justice and, and right relationship. You know, that's at the very heart of, of black history. And so again, using Black History Month to, to target the black community for abortions, I just see that as terribly inconsistent when so much of the civil rights movement has been about respecting mm -hmm. everyone's human dignity and recognizing you know, the importance of human life and that no one should be disregarded or cast off as, as unimportant. And yet again, that is precisely the thing that they do with the child in the womb, with human life in the womb. So I see targeting the black community during Black History Month for abortions as, as being horribly inconsistent with what uh, black history and the civil rights movement in this country have, have been all about. Bishop Shelton Fobb, thank you so much for your time and for joining us from Louisiana this week. Thank you, Catherine, my pleasure. We're going to continue this conversation now in our DC studio with our next guest and pro-life expert. Reverend Dean Nelson is the National Church Outreach Director for Human Coalition. It's good to have you here, Reverend. Catherine, thank you so much. It's great to be back. Absolutely. How have you seen abortion hurt the black community? Wow, well, first of all, we would highlight the millions of children that have been needlessly lost uh, mm -hmm. to abortion first and foremost. But then uh, when we look in certain communities, we can see that even African-American representation in certain communities has actually dwindled. Mm -hmm. That was one of the earlier challenges from some of the pro-life black activists mm -hmm. in the 60s and uh, early 70s was, was that we can't exterminate our people because we'll lose representation. And so um, certainly that's secondary to the lives that have been lost and so also secondary to the women that have been harmed by abortion. Mm -hmm. But in reality, when we talk about our community, our community has been decimated in uh, a large part because of abortion and its role that has ravaged the African-American community. Do you believe, Reverend, the abortion industry not only harms the black community, but actually targets the black community? That's a great question. I, I would say without a doubt. I mean, mm. firsthand when I talk into, you know, brothers and sisters in the hood, they know that Planned Parenthood and abortion clinics are in their communities. Huh. But since just anecdotally, we know that uh, organizations like Protecting Black Life and Life Dynamics for years have done studies that actually demonstrate whether they do it by zip codes in the black community or whether they do it by walking distance within African American and Hispanic communities. We know for certain that Planned Parenthood and other abortionists actually target by placing them there. In fact, in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. just last year, you saw that Planned Parenthood was closing their operations in places like Scranton and in Hershey, but yet they're opening more places in more uh, populated areas with black and Latinos. And of course we know the history of Planned Parenthood as well. Without a doubt, I mean, as we were discussing earlier, how could we, you know, allow Planned Parenthood to escape when their founder, you know, wrote a letter that said that we don't want word to get out, that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And so we know firsthand that that's part of their immoral roots mm. and uh, they carry that on today. At the local level, what can we all do from local churches to reach out and bring home the pro-life message to those who need to hear it? That's a great question. I, I, one of the things that we love to emphasize at Human Coalition is mm -hmm. for people to visit us on our website and our Facebook page at Human Coalition because we have hundreds of memes mm -hmm. that people can share through social media to communicate in a winsome way mm -hmm. a very difficult topic. Right. Uh, we also have short films that people can share so that people can engage on this issue in a meaningful and relevant way. So those are some of the things that I would encourage some of your viewers to do. And that's where a lot of the conversations are happening online, so to have those tools. More and more. Really helpful. 
Just last week, we celebrated the bicentennial 200th birthday of abolitionist Frederick Douglass. You are chairman of the board of the Frederick Douglass Foundation. What can we learn from this man from 200 years ago? What can we learn today for the pro-life movement as we work to end abortion? That's great. I think one of the things that I think about Frederick Douglass is his resiliency. I mm -hmm. mean, regardless of the fact of him being born into slavery, but he fought against a slave master, mm -hmm. uh, escaped from slavery, but then continued in that fight along even later with Susan B. Anthony and the women's suffrage movement. So I think that when I think about Frederick Douglass, one of the things that I think about is always fighting, hmm. always fighting. And then the last thing would be his moral foundation. One of his famous quotes that I enjoy is he says that, you know, um, the whole of my politics is summed up in one phrase, righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to any people. He says that's the positive and the negative of my politics. Persistence and prayer. There that's you go. We, that's what we need to take with us. Reverend Dean Nelson, thanks for being with us. God bless you. Thank you so very much for having me. Thank you. When we come back. We, especially as Christians, we're, we're just very passionate about knowing the context, knowing the, the facts about what's going on, giving clarity to all that. From activism to factivism, how one group uniquely communicates the pro-life message. Stay tuned to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly right after this break. Now the pill, oh wow, aren't we smart, huh? Now we not only kill the baby, we're on the risk of killing the mother. But does anyone care? Well, I heard the other day we have too much population. You've already killed millions and millions and millions and millions of children. You've got too much population, you're kidding yourself. That is EWTN founder's mother Angelica back in 2000 speaking boldly against contraception and abortion. Thank you, Mother Angelica. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. Our laws are an important way to defend life and often are a reflection of our culture. That's why there's a recent lawsuit we need to speak out about. The American Civil Liberties Union filed a lawsuit last week challenging a new Ohio law that prohibits abortions based on a Down syndrome diagnosis. The ACLU is representing abortion providers, including Planned Parenthood. The Ohio law makes it a fourth degree felony for a doctor to terminate a pregnancy based on a Down syndrome diagnosis. Down syndrome is a chromosomal condition that causes developmental delays. Let's be clear about what's happening here. This is not a lawsuit about so-called abortion rights. This is about whether an unborn baby who has been prenatally diagnosed with Down syndrome can be killed for the sole reason of having Down syndrome. This is discrimination at its worst and in the womb. It is discrimination against the youngest members of our human family. Down syndrome is a condition, not a disease, and babies, children, and adults with this genetic condition are a gift to our world. But tragically, they are so often aborted. We've recently seen Iceland brag about almost being Down syndrome free because of the abortions they perform on these babies. Of course, abortion providers are going to jump on this law because it means the abortion providers will lose out on profit if we begin to see the value of the child with Down syndrome. We need to do a better job of showing our culture how people with Down syndrome are a light in this world. Gerber recently did just that when choosing their next folks baby, little Lucas, who has Down syndrome. Every single abortion is a tragedy, and now that abortion providers are suing so they can discriminate against babies to kill them only adds to the devastation. Remember, you have a role to counter today's culture of death. Follow this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com. Send the Trump administration a letter of support for taking action that protects our conscience. We live in the age of information. Today, with the rise of the internet, we are inundated with facts and stats and reports, which means it can be easy for the pro-life message to get lost in the mix. But one group takes creative means to break through with the pro-life message's truth. In this fight, there are so many things clamoring for people's attention. People today communicate with clicks and memes and online shares. 
through it all, the Radiance Foundation strives to make their message shine. Our hope through the Radiance Foundation is to creatively illuminate that every human life has purpose. And as a creative professional myself, who used to work in the ad agency world for years, I love just trying to figure out what messaging resonates. Ryan Baumberger co-founded the Radiance Foundation with his wife, Bethany. Their group aims to creatively affirm every human life has a purpose. I love the power of words and design, infusing them together. And quite honestly, I just consider them divine downloads. Those divine downloads include powerfully pro-life digital graphics and online videos, often with unique and clever jingles. Like one on Planned Parenthood's deception, or this one on the abortion giant's research arm. The Radiance Foundation also produces billboards that can stop traffic. And Baumberger is a frequent pro-life public speaker. That purpose is emblazoned in our hearts at the moment of conception. The circumstance doesn't matter. Baumberger shares how God uniquely qualified him to spread the message that no baby is unplanned or unloved. I grew up in a family of 15. There are 13 kids, 10 of us were adopted. I grew up in a loving, Christian, multiracial family with two parents who loved Jesus. Growing up in a situation where you know, nine of my other, other siblings were adopted and brought out of really broken situations and to see how their lives were so radically transformed by love, I, to me it's a natural kind of involvement then with the pro-life movement because we radically love people. That passion for people combined with creative media is how the Radiance Foundation illuminates the truth about life. Whether it's with a billboard sign or an original music video, the message is clear. Every life has a purpose. To see and learn more about the Radiance Foundation, go to theradiancefoundation.org. There you can find pro-life videos and fact sheets to share online. That's it for this edition of EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. If you have any questions or comments, please reach out to us by emailing prolifeweekly at ewtn.com. I look forward to seeing you here again next week. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.